Hello, everybody. Welcome to Design and Dialogue. I'm Glenn Adamson. I'll be hosting today. And uh, it's not just any day. Of course, we're today observing the um, changing of the guard, uh, the inauguration for uh, the new president of the United States, Joseph Biden, is happening as we speak. And we'll uh, touch on that in just a moment. But as usual, we just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. So first of all, uh, please know that we are going to mute you if you're a live uh, viewer, just for audio quality. As we're talking, please put your questions for our guests into the chat box. And uh, also just let us know where you're zooming in from, if you like, we, we always like to see that and know that. And of course, the conversation will be posted to our archive on Friedman Benda's website after we're done. Uh, so you can always watch again. Uh, so today we have the great pleasure of welcoming to our series uh, the two principal, um, the two principles of Random International, the great innovative uh, digital and interactive art studio. So we have with us Florian Orkras and Hannes Koch. Hi, gentlemen. Good to see you, and welcome to Design and Dialogue. Hello. Thank you, for, you. Um, Thank you. for having us. So um, I just mentioned that the inauguration is um, happening as we speak. And uh, I thought it might be appropriate, and indeed it would be a little strange not to do this, to just say a little bit of something uh, about how you guys are feeling about the moment and the last year that we've been through. Uh, what thoughts do you have as we finally come to the end of the Trump era? And uh, just speaking personally, I'll put it this way, um, restore ourselves to some more uh, credible foundation for American democracy going forward. Yeah, it's a it's a um, it's a great way to celebrate the um, the. I don't think it's a change of guards. It's like the reinstalling of any kind of guards today, um, which is I think we're we're um, we're looking forward to to dial back the toxicity of public conversation um, and the 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 chance to focus on things that actually matter. Um, we, we think that variety of challenges from which the, especially the US, but most public conversation in many countries have checked out um, in order to, to process day-to-day -day sort of you know, Armageddon prevention. Um, and yeah, I, I, th I think we're, we're happy to see that Biden has um, proclaimed publicly anyway, that's very readable here in in in, in Europe, um, and and audible proclaimed that the, the sort of prerogative of science now, an independent scientific approach to governance, and that's a really mm. that's good. You know, mm. we might survive this next year. Yeah, um, <clears throat> well said, Florian. Um, of course, say anything you like, but I'm also interested to know from you whether you think that your work, which after all has a remarkably democratic and public facing quality to it, whether you feel that your work looks differently to you now, even your retrospective work going back years, whether it looks different to you now in this age of, of course, social distancing, but also that kind of um, turbulence and Armageddon prevention mentality that Hannes was just talking about. Yeah, I think for us, it was, um, um, it was, I mean, the last four, the last four years, they were kind of uh, uh, disturbing our, our because uh, the work is so based on, is, is so based on reality. <laughs> and then, you know, to have this, like, where someone says, oh, no, blue is green now. And you're like, that was, um, it was, it, I think, personally, it was uh, it was a very uh, it was a very interesting time. You know that that there's actually acceptance for some kind of that green is blue, um, and the other word um, um, and the other way around. Um, but uh, no, I think I think now it was a uh, for me it was a big relief to see that there's still um, that reality is still reality. And uh, you know that that can be that that uh, that it can be restored, and that we can progress even in small steps rather than have this big like you know seemingly step uh, a step back. Yeah, 
Well, maybe we can hold on to some of these themes. Um, I'm just aware of our time. So I suggest maybe we start looking at images, but I, I will just observe from my perspective as an outsider to your practice that the question of reality is very much at stake in what you do because you also work in simulation. And, and of course you work very heavily in uh, digital technology, which I think for many people feels like a hyper real rather than just a real real, but then bring those dynamics into analog, physical, bodily space. And that's really where a lot of the creative friction of the work seems to happen. So insofar as we've been in a kind of open mouth state of disbelief <laughs> in a lot of respects over the past years, I guess I'll just say um, that your work feels more relevant than ever, perhaps simply because of its fundamental humanism and, and way of trying to um, bring those new technologies into some meaningful relationship with people's direct experience, psychological, physical experience. So I'll just say that in a kind of editorializing way. Um, but Hannes, maybe you want to go ahead and fire up the engines of the images and we can return to some of those themes as we go through. Sure. Um, so can you see this? Is that yeah. visible to everybody? Plug in human. Perfect. It's 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 one of these sort of um, lenses through which we, I guess, look at the look at the the, the work, and that's an ongoing process. Um, Flo and I develop work on a fairly in a fairly instinctive um, procedure. There's a lot of dialogue and a lot of rational going into it in terms of execution and fabrication and realization of, of these works. But I think that the actual core of the development is, is instinctive. So for us, this review process now, how does it relate? How, how, where, where does it sit? What does it, where, where do, in, in essence, where do, the, where do these instinctive triggers come from? That's something ongoing and, and, and interesting. And, um, uh, and I think we'll, we'll for, for us, there were some surprising moments in the last few years, especially in terms of we're coming to that later, collective behavior, um, uh, uh, how, how we as humans plug us into this world. And I think we as artists plug humans into, the, into, the, into, into our work, into the, into the sculptures and environments we're creating. Um, and and we're, we're prototyping these plugged in situations where we find us, uh, and that's pretty cross cultural, cross culturally mm -hmm. applicable. We find us often in situations um, that we're not really designed to deal with, in terms of exposure to technology, to cognitive processes, which is permanently overtaken left, right, and center by by things. And I think. Um, that's very general findings and realizations that we try to be specific about in some of the work. And, and I think that's um, with, 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 the, with the work we do, we explore how this incredibly exponentially growing speed of mechanization, digitization, algorithmicification impacts us on a, on a very human, human uh, level. And, and yeah, I think this, um, Pontus Hultin quote is a, is a nice sort of thing to ride on for a bit. Uh, when we say we, that's um, Flo and I found at random uh, in 2000 and through three, five, something five, probably we studied together. We worked together since the, the late nineties uh, while studying. Uh, it's now grown into large team, um, in London mainly, but also in Berlin, um, mm. in two studios. Uh, we've spent 15 years now developing a lot of sort of groundwork to be able to deploy and realize the, 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 the works that we dream up. And this is our Berlin studio on the Osram campus, the lighting manufacturers very fittingly, which is a whole turbine hole. Um, and um, yeah, and, and we're, we're, yeah, we've been international, working internationally 
uh, with a global client base for the last 10, mm -hmm. 15 years. Hannes, uh, can, I, us that, can I stop you there for one second? It's amazing to see sure, the, yeah. sort of Peter Barron's worthy building that you're working out of in Berlin. Mm -hmm. But um, I just wanted to ask you just to expand a little bit on that early moment of your uh, partnership. So you studied at the Royal College of Art in London, despite being German by background. And um, I was just wondering if you cast your mind back 15 years to you know 2005 or so when the studio was coming together, what the situation was with digitally um, enhanced or digitally um, enabled design and what were you walking into? Like, was there already a scene or a set of capabilities and knowledge built up around the kind of things that you've gone on to do? Or did you feel like you were working really from a blank slate? I, I, I think we had no idea what we're walking into really. It, it, for us, it was always, and increasingly now it's like, uh, uh, what we what we came out of I think we're the last generation that grew up and fully formed pre-millennial mm. um, we we grew up without mobile phones until we were 22 uh, like we had our first phone like mobile phones in England when we started studying that to to, to call home you know ET style we had um, email was not a thing until we had left school um, we were fully analog uh, and then had to imagine of uh, the, all the wonders and marvels of, of, of dematerialization, of digitalization, mm -hmm. of this transition of the manufacturing, the product, the, 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 the material world into, into, into digital um, domain. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, one of the first and, one of our first projects was born from the fact that suddenly you could take pictures with your phones. You know, so you you could take pictures of everything, and they would be on your phone, and you would you would not like how like how often would you look at them? So we developed this tool that you could take those pictures and uh, and print them wherever you wanted. You know, but that because that was before Instagram, there was nothing what you could you know you couldn't you couldn't really use those pictures and they were tiny they were like uh i don't know like a, a hundredth of the resolution that we have uh that we have now so uh yeah and that was the first kind of response um to that mm. and how did you guys skill yourself up i don't, I don't want to dwell too much on on this early moment because there's so much to look at in your body of work but um i can imagine that uh, you must have been very autodidactic that is teaching yourselves all along the way, uh, sort of building a plane as you were flying it kind of energy. Is that right? I think the ground, the, the foundations were, were laid in, in, in by studying design, mm -hmm. which was an incredibly tactical move in hindsight. Um, the, the school we went to was promoted to foreign students, to non-UK non students as the new Bauhaus. Yeah. Uh, I, I think they just said that because we were German and, and <laughs> I think they did say that to everyone. Like full <laughs> amalgamation of art and, you know, and I think both Flo and I wanted to, wanted to, to do sculpture and painting and drawing and, and, and stuff and there, we, we didn't really, I think that the one thing we knew was that we already by when we started out, we felt that this the 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 time of the single single hero monolithic personality which expresses herself or himself creatively that was over mm -hmm. that was very very tangible already so this sort of the the, the openness to color collaboration and and collective approach to, to creative self-expression was already um, was already quite dominant even at the early stages when we didn't know what sort of expression we would find for our for our practice in the end um, but that it would be something like our practice was already that we loved working together working in a team complementarily or com in a complementary fashion that was already quite um, quite visible then and then um, and that it was a very Sort of nuts and bolts, you know, electronics. There was no nothing creative about nothing Bauhausy. 
nothing nothing like that no sort of you know body expression dance sessions in the evenings no it was just doing maths until 4 a.m to mm. you know be able to calculate the fluid dynamics and stuff all in all everything turned out to be a, an incredibly useful toolkit for developing work later on at the, at the royal college which is where we mm. absolutely felt we had to go to just you know get, get compensated for this utter lack of um of our artistic self-expression in, in in our undergraduate studies and then really took it you know with ron ron arat as a professor uh who, who was very pluralist very um very open to anything um original uh very un hmm. orthodox uh, a, a, everything we had learned was was quite quite um quite useful then and that and from then on i think after the rca that equipped us with this idea of, okay if you want to if you want to know how something works you, by then we could teach ourselves and that that's when this autodidactic um specialism started you know we, we need to work out how water works so let's let's learn that let's work on chemistry for photochromic stuff let's work that let's understand motors and how to program them let's work out mm. you know um and that's to this day i think that's a that's something that's sort of inscribed great okay that's a great um opening to the uh body of work then so um, let's go ahead and have a look. Speaking of fluid dynamics, here's the rain room. Fluid dynamics, exactly. Um, so th this starts a bit in the middle. I think this is this is one of the projects that um, got us um, known to to wider audiences, first in the UK and then across the US um, in 2012, 2013. Um, we were about six years old. It's um, it's called Rain Room. Um, it's it came out of a four-year development process, um, trying to realize what originally was literally a thirty-second fantasy. It was like, um, how awesome would it be to create a situation where you cocoon, where you're in, engulfed in a in an incredibly powerful natural phenomena without being actually touched by it, without being immediately affected. Um, in hindsight, of course, this is a perfect visualization of the precise two meters of social distancing. It is a very lonely experience. It's literally best enjoyed alone. It's very meditative, monotonous. The sound, the smell, the, the, the I think the immersion is, is, is extremely physical here, um, and it's it's a. In, I think our our main challenge over that the four years between 2008 and 12, uh, when the first was shown to the public at the Vatican, um, was to, was maintaining the simplicity, keeping it to what it what it is here, um, and it's. Uh, I think to this day we have a lot of. Um, a lot of fun with this project. It's um, whenever it's shown, there's some unique qualities to to build out. It's a fantastic platform, very versatile platform for us to think about very very relevant day to day topics. Um, you know, automation. How how do sentient spaces um, respond to people how do you insert yourself as a person into sentient architecture that very instinctively reacts to you how is the relationship between control is the space controlling how you move or are you controlling by your sheer presence how the space behaves the sort of interplay and, and our human delusion in that regard is, is something you can study here automation architecture and so on and so forth the sensory design um what immersive qualities where they hit you and why they are. Um, kind of, uh, you might want to come off the video because it's a little loud, so it's a little harder to hear you. Yeah, yeah, thanks. But it's incredible to see that for those who haven't experienced it in person. Um, and it is, you know, it's that um, exact thing of the digital sort of presenting itself to the visitor as a kind of magic. And I, I did want to ask you um, 
since that project, as you said, got such attention and really catapulted you to worldwide fame as experience makers, um, sort of how that felt for you and whether you felt that audiences were actually getting it at the level that you intended it or whether it was slipping into a kind of spectacle culture that you um, might have had a, a sort of critical instinct about. So, you know, what was that kind of incredible breakout moment like for you both? <clears throat> Flo, do you want to? Flo, it looks like you're muted actually. Yeah, there we go. Well, I, I, uh, yeah. So, uh, no, I mean, it was, uh, I'm, like I always go back to the to the first moment when we saw it in the Barbican and we uh, you know we switched it on everything everything was working like we wanted it and we stood there and it's like uh, you know what if uh, what if it's only us that likes this <laughs> <You know? laughs> because maybe no one maybe maybe no one wants to come into this like dark and uh, uh, rainy um, rainy part of the Barbican. Uh, in November, in October, November, no, we have the we have similar things outside, um, and uh, in, no, and I think we were, we were, uh, we were completely taken by surprise by the, um, um, by um, by how popular and how quickly it became popular, and in terms of, I, I think for us it's always really important to not be we, we don't put something out there and we say this is what you think what you should think about it mm. for us they're more like experiments like oh you know what what do people do in, in like like when they're suddenly exposed to uh exposed to something pretty surreal like this so it's uh, in terms of like i don't feel it doesn't feel right to judge oh it's it's too much of a spectacle. I don't think we ever, or I never thought of it like that. It's much as, like, as I said, it's, it's interesting to see, you know, like what other people like, like in it, you know, what other people see mm. in it, because we are kind of, because if you have, if you have made it for like, I mean, like we worked on this for like three, four, three, four years, pretty relentless. Lee, you know, you, you, you kind of, you get very absorbed by detail. So um, I said, it's always, it's nearly a pity that we can't walk in ourselves and don't know it. Mm. You know, we will, you will never, you will, um, like, you will not know how that, how that, how that feels, but. Um, or or I mean, capture the mystery that visitors of course have, because it's very difficult to understand why you're experiencing it what exactly you are experiencing even much less how it works and what the kind of backstage technology is that makes it possible so that that gap is i suppose that's why i call it magic and i don't mean magic in the sense of um actual enchantment or sorcery i mean magic in the sense of you know a great stage magician you know that they're, they're doing something um that is explainable but you can't explain it to yourself and it's the it's the wonder of sheer human capacity that strikes you perhaps in that moment. That's certainly what strikes me when I look at NASA, when, 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 when Flo and me once went to the um, at JPL and, and when mm -hmm. we did the brain room at LACMA, we, we went there, there's this sort of, you know, proximity and this love, deep appreciation and from my part, love for for this extraordinary um, and relentless pursuit of knowledge, uh, which you know, in space, um, in in space exploration, you, it's, it's, it becomes very visible. Mm. Um, I, I think with with the with the, the there is a part of of rain of rain room where I where I understand. The, and I think it's a, also a rightful criticism of, and, and, and I think Rain Room acts as a catalyst for that criticism of, um, of the loudness of it. Why does, art, why does an experience have to be so intense? 
mm. for, for to get through to and I think we got through to people with this with this vehemence that rain room has it's not a quiet but you know you easily can see that um being sitting in a, in a very sort of exposed spot um it's it's it has to be it has to be criticized for that because it's a it's a criticism of our current times because things have to be extremely loud um mm -hmm. to to get through to us emotionally and to touch us and and i think that is something really worth discussing it doesn't for me it doesn't devalue the work at all um i i think it's a good it's a really good point of departure to to start wondering why because you know you, you we've seen that subsequently you know immersion is such a big thing and becomes a bigger and bigger thing you know this intensity that people feel they need from, from where, where, and that goes for looking at art as much as it does for your home cinema for everything and that, yeah. that, you know it, it's it's um uh and they're, it's, a, it's a really relevant and important question. Mm. What, why, 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 that, why that is a thing now? Um, you know, maybe, Hannes, we could go on to this next body of work, um, which is more about the bot and mechanics of the body. Um, but just one other thing to say about that is I completely agree with what you're saying about intensity and the kind of short attention span theater that we all live in, which, of course, is itself very connected to the digital and the pervasiveness of digital technology in our lives. But I guess the other thing about Rain Room, and it's going to be true of this uh, bodily motion-based work we're about to look at too, is that it's also um, representing natural phenomena to you in a way that might encourage you to rethink them or encounter them as if for the first time. Yes, I, I think that the... the what it does trigger on a rational level, I think, is is certainly something like rain room. It's like, what you know, what if this is the only way that you can experience nature? And if you, um, and you know, be that via virtual or augmented reality devices or whatever. But I mean, that's pretty, it goes. It becomes a pretty dystopian, pretty, mm. uh, uh, pretty bleak train of thought very quickly. And again, that's a good thing. That sort of um. That's part of this emotional prototyping process, which is a very introspective thing that we do, I think, a lot in the first place for ourselves. Like, how how would that be? How would that feel to experience that? Um, and and that's a good. I think that is a very powerful way of of trying to come up with offerings of change. You know, there's this once you've once you've been in rain room and you've had you have this odorless very mechanized minimalist experience of rain there is absolutely no way that it compares to the experience of actual conscious experience of actual rain mm. in nature um, and maybe that makes you that triggers a thought process and act action process that um that is is a, um different from how you behave before perhaps i don't know mm. okay We'll Body in motion. Time to um, proceed. Yes. Yeah. Um, sort of chronological. I think it's we, we've put in because we're only at the beginning. We've put in something that we often talk and show about because it, it was a very sort of foundational um, and it formatted our practice or the way we, that we function as as a as a practice. Um, in, in the way that we collaborate with scientists and with scientific ideas. And um, this is this is an um, experiment show, presented to us by, 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 um, uh, uh, by a neuroscientist, uh, Phil Barnard from Cambridge, who, <clears throat> who gave us a little talk about how we as humans perceive motion um, and what happens uh, in our brains and in our hearts when we see it. We can't look at moving stuff without attaching meaning to it. We need to attach emotional meaning to, to that. So we, we you, you can't right. rationalize looking at this. You, you go like, okay, it's, it, they're hunting, they're aggressive, they're, they're this and that. And of course, this has a huge, um, can have and did have for us a huge impact on how we, how we develop kinetic uh work it, it was like oh that's why 
a sculpture engages me or, or we react to it. And, and, you know, it's almost like a, um, it's a sort of underlying fabric of how, how we detail some of our work. One of them would be audience here, to sort of um, one of our first explorations of kinetic sculpture where you you insert the human into the sculpture and 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 space relationship um, and what you get is a complete role reversal immediately you 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 the sculpture is only observing the the human and the human becomes the performer and he performs or she performs for the sculpture so the, you've got 64 little objects which behave like human heads they they mimic accurately the the movement very reduced movement of the human head and follow a person around that's all they do so you act as a sort of magnet for the attention of the mirrors and then at points you you lose that attention you know they 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 stop being interested in you they get bored by you and then they look somewhere else and it's a very very simple um very simple relationship building exercise and it's incredibly powerful it leads to very instinctive very easily um sort of lose yourself situations like this this wasn't staged this was just a guy um who starts to to get incredibly interested in in this moment where the mirrors follow him and it's i think it's like this empowerment um <clears throat> and we find this interesting you know this how how you can by very simple means you can override people's inhibitions they suddenly go like oh i dance you know oh i'm your master little mirrors i i do this and you know you can only guess what what he felt when he did it, but you can see it um and we find this is a very powerful way of building relationships between people and spaces uh, and this is pretty much in, in different iterations that's that that's a really good lens for us to look at our look mm. at our work um because also, that's changed mm -hmm. uh, i was just going to say it also introduces the theme uh which turns out to be a persistent one in your work of technology reflecting ourselves at ourselves and becoming like a registration tool for our own behavior and self-regard and he's such a great example of that but the kind of wonderful playfulness that this is bringing out in him no it, and, and this and also like the how we how we how quickly you can perceive something that you know is is uh, a piece of metal with two motors you know that you get the feeling that it is a life mm. like even that it's you know we didn't try to package it like as a as a um you know with with uh, with features that would tell you oh you know we want to we want to we want to make you think this is a life it's a very simple like the very geometric it's very uh, very industrial, but you cannot simply through movement, you know, you get the you get the impression that there's kind of there's some kind of consciousness or agency um, or life like something something is alive, you know, even if you can rationally say, oh, no, you know, it's motors with a mirror and uh, I, I actually can figure out how the person is tracked and how then the mirrors are, are moved, but but it's completely overwritten by the you know by the uh, by the emotion you have when you see and everyone talks of them everyone everyone in the studio ever like um talks of them as oh the little guys you know mm -hmm. no like, like it's 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 and that's you know that's purely through movement so um mm -hmm. uh, again oh, like I like what like what we saw before this stop frame animation that's like 80 years old and that's was one of the first attempts of, 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 of scientists to study how, what that actually does to us, you know? How many people would describe this as triangles moving when they are asked after seeing this, you know? And lots of people would say, oh, there's the evil one and there's the nice one and there's the, you know, the one that is scared and is hiding and, you know, like we cannot, and that's, it, it's, an, it's, an, it's, an, it's actually an inability to not think about movement differently than that. You know, we're made to, we see something moving, we attach, you know, like, we cannot not attach something to it. We cannot purely rational, rationally describe or experience these things. Yeah. That's a precognitive process. And I think as, as far as sort of 
uh, relating this to current and future um, matters, it's terrifying if you think what consequences this lovely guy dancing with with little little mirrors has when you think further the 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 uh, uh, mechanization robotification of our daily lives mm -hmm. you know if they behave a bit human we're sold we're like like literally sold we're like hey uh, how are you you know we're, we're, we're designed like that and that's that's something to pay attention to and will be and it's uh, and and really worth um worth exploring so i, I think to, to to progress so this is um not not quite chronologic this is a um uh the the, the prototype that's in our berlin studio it's the um it's the it's a prototype a, 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 a mock-up of a very large-scale permanent public um version pretty much of the same train of thought there are different iterations but it's it's relating so this is this is a, a they only um they only behave if you like around one axis um they they spin they turn they follow you they're not entirely mirror finished they're almost mirror finished um and they've they've followed all of them follow you and then lose interest in you look at somebody else it's sort of the public art permanent public version of audience if you like um and the and it's for us the scale here is really interesting to explore because it's it's also there is an opportunity here to relate for the for the human for our human scale to relate to the architecture to the to this cold anonymous built environment which then suddenly comes to life which is you know if it comes to life that not doesn't always have to have positive implications but it's a it's a thing that happens anyway with buildings that read us yeah. our presence our people flow and so on and so forth. Um, and that this is a very sort of physical amplification. This is how that feels when the space is has an algorithmic presence and and sees you and reads you and then responds to you. <clears throat> um, and this is something we're incredibly excited about. I think this is something that we've always been striving for, and it only started in the last couple of years, two two three years, that we feel equipped and we are equipped. Um, sort of infrastructurally uh, to to deploy this kind of thinking, this kind of sculpture into the into the public. Um, and also a fascinating um, application of the language of abstraction, because I, I was thinking as you guys were talking that, of course, the animation and sort of human-like or emotional characteristics of digital technology are around us all the time, and we're quite used to that. And they, as you say, Hannes, are being used to manipulate us all the time as well. Um, and it's almost as if by stripping back to, to an abstract language or a kind of basic condition of the motorized mirrors that you're giving people a chance to encounter technology as such and the animation of technology as such. So sort of exposing that condition that we are in otherwise, but giving people a chance to intersect with it um, reflectively, literally and figuratively. Yeah, that, that's the that's the I, I think that's the starting point. It's quite a powerful experience if, if, because there is there is definitely this kind of feeling of control that people enjoy also on their iPhone screen. You know, this mm -hmm. this instinctive when something reacts organically to you and you just uh, it's very joyful. Uh, and there there is this sort of um, uh, uh, you, you know on, if that happens on this grand scale and four these are four meters high mm -hmm. each. And 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 you're the ma you know you 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 master them. It's almost like an extension of your body over significant amount yet overviewable amount of space, and it's physical, you know. And everybody can see it. You become the center of attention there, and that's I think that's a quite um, quite interesting emotional experience. We pluck ourselves into that, and then see see how that goes. You know, mm. um, it's going to be uh, seen. This is a sort of um, moving on from that. That once we had figured out the, this sort of very basic kinetic reaction, we felt okay. We can read people in sp in space in terms of the, the the sort of tools that we can work with and use to express our thinking and and our feeling. Here, we got very interested in in this moment where you rec you know mirrors are interesting. We have these vast 
capabilities there were on the horizon back in 2012, 2010, to, to, for digital augmented mirrors and stuff. So, so, so we developed this, this framework of, of um, seeing what happens when you actually fuck, uh, when you play with a mirror image. Mm. When, when, when you're not sure, is that me? Is that somebody else? Is that, is, is that going to be, you know, and, and you know, it is, is that a glitch in the technology? There's this ambivalence, which isn't it like technology glitch. It's an intentional thing where you, where you get people again in, in this loop of playing with themselves. It's almost like this, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's autoplay, if you like. Um, and there, there are different iterations of this moment, which we, which we in, enjoy and which, again, it's, it's a, the time-based component here is also something that interests us. We're, we're just taking ourselves out of, of the presence and, and, and insert ourselves uh, um, in, into, the, into the future a little bit here, or in, in the past, depending on your perspective. It's both you and this image, so depending on where you are, but you, you know, you're, 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 you're unplugging yourself from the present moment, which is yeah. something we see and all the time, everywhere, you know, on, on digital, this immersion in digital devices. Uh, and this is, a, again, a manif amplification of that. Um, the, mm -hmm. the specific work was made. There's a huge component for us to transport our work, to communicate it, to present it to the, to the public is with performative qualities um, because we want people to explore their own performative intentions in front of them. Can I dance? Can I move? You know, be... be how like become physical in front and with the work. Uh, and for that, we found a fantastic um, partner over many, many projects with Wayne McGregor, mm -hmm. um, British choreographer. I uh, were just uh, working in the process of, of uh, uh, launching a, a new work called um, No One Is An Island, a partnership with the BMW Culture Group um, these weeks. So watch out on, on Instagram. Um, this here he designed a specific choreography chore, choreography for m merging two human physical bodies in in the same virtual or semi virtual space in the sculpture um, and they're also um, so it's a sort of Gesamtkunstwerk where they also uh, uh, um, impact the the score Max Richter the composer um, wrote a score which is um, in parts directed by the by the physical movement of both dancers, which are captured mm -hmm. through um, 3D computer vision. Um, yeah, I, uh, can I, if I could just um, interject another observation. Um, I noticed a couple of times you talked about plugging people in or unplugging them from an artwork. And it makes me think about the idea of transforming a body into information which I guess on some level is what's happening in those works, whether it's the dancer or a member of the public. Another thing that in a perhaps more dystopian frame of mind, we might think of that as another thing that's happening to us all the time being turned into information that's itself a kind of commodity. And um, I think rediscovering the joy of having yourself dematerialize and then rematerialize in a technological guise feels quite powerful. And then also in particular, that idea of, um, thinking through the body as a, a set of procedures or a set of raw emotions that can then be processed through choreography, which makes me think about Merce Cunningham and other forms of modern dance. Mm -hmm. um, it just feels like a really uh, generative partnership that you've formed with Wayne McGregor, really you know, creating new forms of dance that are impossible without this technological apparatus, but relate in a very deep way to the history and principal concerns of that discipline. So that, that really feels like a huge kind of creative breakthrough, that, that particular partnership to me. I, I, looking at, at Cunningham and, and Rauschenberg, um, when, when we discovered that what, 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 you know, that, that sort of relationship existed between artist and choreographer and, and back 40, 50 years ago and the, with the yeah. Eats project and so on, um, we were like, oh, we get it. Yeah, it is. It's, it makes so much sense, you know. And then, yeah. um, and I, actually, reading up on 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 those processes also, you know, re reinvigorated our um, our desire also to to. We I think generally you can 
rest assured that we feel physically inadequate when you're confronted with all these people <laughs> with incredible control over their body. So to do any kind of even think about breathing or something, it, it started out as a very, but now you, you go like, oh, can, can you actually do this? Like how, 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 how would that work? with the human body because it, you know the body becomes a material in this in this sense and as as much as you know some some of our sculpture becomes a prop for Wayne to to develop some thinking towards and it's it's a very mutually um beneficial relationship often um i think in, well, we're in, in this, terms of what uh, this connection um can i just ask you to talk a little bit about the word random or randomness which you chose as the name of your studio because thinking about Rauschenberg and uh, Cunningham in that moment, of course, one thinks also of John Cage and the idea of chance operations and uh, aleatory or arbitrary dynamics entering the, the work. And I, I feel like I can sort of intuit why randomness would be so interesting to you, but then there's also a very strong sense of control and calculation in the work that feels to me like the opposite of chance operations. So I wonder how that um, word sits for you guys in relation to your practice? It actually came from when we started working together. Uh, we were all doing very different uh, uh, different things. So it was about, there was something in common. We didn't quite know what we uh, what it was. And uh, we also liked the, uh, the meaning of the English word randomness because it's, it has, um, uh, it can be um, it can be negative and destructive, but it can also be uh, very, very interesting and, you know, the birth of something uh, of something new. So it felt the, um, uh, it felt like the right name uh, to, uh, to use. And uh, yeah, but now, like, as you said, we rely a lot on like, you know, knowing what exactly will happen when a person yeah. is having a certain point or something. So, it's <laughs> so, um, um, so yeah, but I think we keep it. <laughs> you will also, I, that, I, going back <laughs> to that plugging in idea, of course, the visitor becomes the random element, like that guy with the mirrors that in some way he is, like the, the artwork itself is a system and the person becomes the um, wonderfully chancy unpredictable part of it so there's maybe a, a little backdoor window into the humanism that i mentioned earlier perhaps i i i think that's that like that was completely unpredictable back then mm -hmm. uh, i i think also this focus on exploring our instinctual and emotional reactions to the world was un that's nothing we were i think able to formulate when we started out, mm. um, and and I think to be true truthful, for a moment we were like, is this actually a, the, the, does that still, you know, we're utter control freaks. We have to be. There's so much stuff that, you know, is, when you when you work in with this level of experimentation, um, they, they, there's so much that can go not as you predicted and, and can go wrong or differently and, and stuff. So you need to maintain as much control as possible. It's just completely, you know, fighting windmills. Um, and we were like, is this actually a thing we should be celebrating? And I think in the end, it, it, um, it absolutely is because I think the, the randomness of human, human imagination and human behavior is still something that we really, I think, it, it just settled in and the way we work together and stuff we we, we have this mandatory op openness internally go like, okay uh we should probably try this and then you you, you try something there's a it's not out of unvaluing some you know it's 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 it's, it's like a distillation it's almost like a dis distillation engine to go okay let's try this it's completely random but prop let's have a look you know and I think we, we, we're, we're now we, we're confident in, in the level of focus we have and what we what we want. And it's it's I think this random element is, is still it's vital. Mm -hmm. Cool. OK, um, Hans, we only have about 10 minutes left, so let's go through the rest of the images and videos. I think this is these are sort of iterations. I think one one thing that uh, is hugely relevant 
which we didn't know when we started um, is, 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 is sort of this diving into collective behavior, which is something we've done since 2007. Um, and it's, it's looking at, um, looking at swarming behavior, you know, but, but to begin with, we, we, uh, we translated that into light installations. We looked at algorithms that could simulate swarming behavior of insects, birds, fish, you know, schools of it. There are like 100 words for snow, and there are like 1,000 words for flocking, swarming, and schools of fish and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we were absolutely fascinated uh, by the powerful aesthetic expression of, um, of intention here without any any visible sign of who's in charge, you know, it's an incredibly powerful topic. It's it remained so, and it, it's, it happens to be very un, under research or happens to be very under research. And then I think in, a, a few years ago we did, and, and so, so we, we transported that together with um, uh, it, uh, uh, Carpenter's Workshop Gallery. We did, you know, really, um, very, very intricate light installation, translating this sort of algorithmic approach into into physical uh, light sculptures. This is a very large one, um, a very large swarm study. We did that on a facade in, in Chemnitz in, in a train station. Uh, we did small, small ones. Always, you know, it's not species specific. It's, it's, um, it is a life algorithm that plays out. It's not recorded. Um, this is in, in New York. Um, uh, 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 at the um, Pr Pritzker in, in the Pritzker collection at the um, uh, uh, what, Flo, what's the what's the what's the name Park of the, uh, uh, Park Hyatt Hotel um, di different iterations of it um, completely self built um, in in order to to express this algorithm in ex precisely the fashion that we. That we wanted to, um, and and it's it's now come into you know we we're, we're just after doing this for a few kind of a decade almost we started looking at the algorithm again and the implications like what is this thing actually what what and and then starting to look hey can we can we just even on a two dimensional plane can we can we um, again plug in the human you know which what what happens is there are there ways of engaging um engaging the, the the body in in this and not so medium specific you know be this a projection or a you know what is this like is is there is there something in it and can like given that we perceive this algorithm this this organism here as sentient can we is it like can it learn can mm -hmm. it learn to see us can can we go beyond this dull data visualization and can we can we you know, cut through that and go into making it actually something that can learn how to deal with our presence, whether it attacks it or, you know, here, it's, here we act as a repellent for it. This is just a conceptual sort of placeholder. It, it's not, not a design for, for, a, for a work. Um, and that's invigorating. That's like really, we're, you know, we're, we're slowly, slowly figuring out how to and what form to give it to, to express that. Um, and it's something where, where um, especially this learning component is something we're incredibly um, interested in to see how, how we can give this organism, this algorithm, the ability to learn and express it. And this is one we normally do not show these, but this is something which is in development as a, um, as a platform, which um, we would love to also one day bring out into the public sphere um to um you know to 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 make this experience of swarming permanent public experience experienceable outdoors with this learning um element that the organism in there is out of our control and in the in the hands of the of itself basically so it figures out how it relates to your to your presence yeah um, and like i think this is I was just going to say it's um, it's like you're finding a poetic or aesthetic correlate to artificial intelligence, maybe roughly comparable to the way that the Cubists found an aesthetic correlate to the um, ideas of relativity or 
other forms of modern information and technology, you know, new understandings of that time. I think it's very unusual to see um, an expression of what artificial intelligence looks like that actually gives you some kind of emotive relationship again to that that prospect of machine learning in and of itself. Uh, you feel like you're really directly encountering that reality. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that's that's and this, that's yeah. the. And this, and then you have obviously the slightly darker element again. You know, what if the little, the black dots that you saw? What if that's you know? What if that's actually if you like if you relate that to how we behave. Yeah. as a group together you know like um and i think things like twitter have really brought that out in us where you can really see suddenly there's a spark and you know it it, it can be for the good or the bad but it you know suddenly there's this this is this like motion and you don't know where it's coming from everyone contributes a little bit and it you know and it goes and it goes into it creates a massive move into into uh into one or the other hmm. direction so um, yeah so you're right that that mob mentality that we've mm -hmm. of course seen all too recently uh, seems mapped there as well. Um, Hannes, um, maybe we should wrap up now with the presence and absence uh, work before we draw to a close. Yeah. Oh, um, I forgot that this was coming. Um, <laughs> I think that's that's sort of. The, the, I'll, I'll fly through it. This is this is um, one. You know, the the first body of work that we ever. Um, showed in, uh, with a gallery with Carpenters in 2008. Um, we've uh, developed this um, further uh, over the years. Uh, last year, launching a large, um, large uh, um, work called Presence and Erasure. It, it sort of it gradually started speaking to this narcissistic moment. Um, where you love seeing your own portrait and then disappears. It's a it's a printing process that um, excites a UV reactive surface. It changes color for a moment for about a minute. You can print any kind of image and it then fades out and you can reprint and reprint and reprint. So sort of 2000, the noughties version of the etcher sketch, if you like. Yeah. Um, but, but with some sort of... Um, you know, facial recognition software uh, spiced up, and and uh, its gallery and and the um, Paradise City in Korea uh, a year ago, um, called or a year and a half ago, Presence and Erasure, which is a super large iteration, printing these glorified portraits, super high resolution, beautiful quality of the unwitting spectator. So you don't know mm. who's going to be the, the victim. And I think it delights people to see themselves really large. And at the same time, um, you have zero control. You know, it's, a, it's, it's one of these completely ubiquitous tracking systems. It picks out people, randomly posterizes their photo, and then, and then prints it. So the, it's this almighty and unavoidable, in a way, algorithm and that's not the focus i think the focus again because of course you can wear a mask and, and scramble the face detection i think that the actual point here is that people love seeing themselves it's this precognitive stockholm syndrome where you love to engage with something that is extremely hurtful potentially you know and, and detrimental to your to your well-being or to, to our species well-being and that's a, such an allegoric theme and and again this is a really uh, um this is just for us a way to come to grips with that and express that somehow with with this um with this ma machine here with this sculpture <clears throat> yeah. uh, and this is this is it in action so print it out and by the time it finished printing it's essentially that's Coralie from uh place gallery in super blue uh in korea here um it, it's just gone, you know, it's, it's, and then you go like, Hey, that's me. Um, and, and this is, this is a topic in many different iterations, which keeps, keeps us very busy. I think very busy. Yeah. It's such a brilliant manifestation of where our culture is at with regard to our own, uh, narcissist like relationship to our own images and also the ephemerality of those images often, which are kind of in one eye out the other. And it, it just seems like an absolutely perfect uh, collective portrait of, of um, you know, 
that captivating phenomena that you know that selfie selfie culture that we, we talk about all the time but again very rarely presented to you in terms such that you kind of understand it in its uh totality and its magnitude it's really um haunting and somehow disturbing as well as very beautiful and um you know quite transcendental experience all those things at once i, f I feel like those oppositions are really uh ones that run through your work you know it, it is simultane simultaneously often so uh dystopian and disturbing but also ravishing and aesthetically transporting it's a, it's a really um fine finally judged balance that you guys are striking all the time so um maybe we could just uh bring it to an end there at least the images and i'll, I'll just ask one or two questions i know we had one which is actually relevant to to that image um from tammy landis who just asked about the relationship of your work to that jeff coon sculpture um she was asking in relation <laughs> to the earlier mirror because i mean he, he is of course the ultimate example of a kind of spectacular artist who also thinks about these issues of self-reflection and um egomania perhaps as well not not as his egomania but the broader egomania that he's engaging with and reflecting we, we were we were fighting hard to remove it is the truth oh, uh, were you from really? the gallery but but it was it wasn't a big yeah, thing on it uh, uh, we wanted the gal we're, we're narcissists as well. We wanted the gallery to ourselves, and they had recently installed a, it's a it's a collecting institution and in, it's in a private private museum in Korea, uh, and they had only opened it like a few show like two or three shows before us, uh, and they were unwilling to move it, and we were like, okay, can we just? So there was no curatorial intent. Uh, in the opposite, we weren't. Uh, uh, we weren't successful in having it. Um, it's funny though, because it could be considered a brilliant adjacency and a kind of a <laughs> commentary as well. So, yeah, no credit where credit is due. The, here, none is due. <laughs> so, so, a similar question uh, from TPQ Studio. They say, uh, "Rain Room is so well traveled. Do you see it more like a modernist artwork, or does the site, the gallery, museum, play some role to determine viewership?" Ah. Uh, I I don't understand the question. Um, how how is it? Well, I th I think the the question is how how relational is it to the institution where it's shown, or do you consider it to be a kind of discrete autonomous work that needs to be respected in the way that any sculpture would? I think the latter. It's 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 it's. Due to its infrastructural needs, it requires, and I think that's what we're what we're starting uh, or, or, or aspiring to start now with Super Blue, um, the sort of um, ex experience-based arm of pace or spin-off from Pace Gallery is to to um, to develop a framework in which the, you know the, all the all the positives of an institutional context can be respected and maintained. Um, yet you don't you're almost overburdened an institution with you know you you go through hoops and loops in a museum to put to produce rain room you need huge resources to to put it up um usually it doesn't fit into institutional programming so easily because it only really makes sense to put rain room up for for a longer um, time unless you're the charge art foundation they've built a building so they 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 spun it off uh, and out of their normal regular exhibition program um similar to, to jklp in australia um so so I, I think it makes more sense to consider it a, a sort of um, solitary standalone thing. What we think is is has uh, uh, not been taken advantage of in the past is the sort of programmatic platform that Rain Room could offer. I think a bit with Expo One and and at the MoMA that was the case because it's a, their Rain Room really fitted into this mega generous program all about. Um, all sort of in light of Sandy um, and the curatorial approach, but not often when we showed Rain Room, that there was the, the, the building context was quite a, you know, all the resources for that usually were bound by bringing the work up and running in the in the institution, uh, and I think that's something we're, we're really looking forward to working on with with Mark and Molly and Coralie and Super Blue uh, to 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 fix that to. 
make use of that platform. Hmm. Let me um, just ask you one last question on my own behalf, which is just to think about the future of your work. And I, I was thinking about Jean Tangley's kinetic artworks from the 60s, which are sometimes lovingly preserved and restored. And it's amazing to see them go, you know, 50, 60, 70 years after the fact. And I wonder what you guys think, um, particularly since you're already very interested in erasure and transience, I wonder what you guys sort of expect your work to be like in a hundred years time. Um, and whether that's something you think about, like the long-term trace that you're leaving in the world in those, in those works. Ooh. We some, uh, I mean, we, we a lot of the times come from a very practical point of view to keep them, you know, to, to, to maintain them over, you know, and then there was a big question once where, where it was about do, does it need, what is, what is for us the important bit? Is it the, is it that it's exactly built how it was built in the 2010s, you know, or, or is it actually, or, or is it about uh, bringing across what they should, what they should do, what they should mean? And we came to the conclusion that if, you know, if, if, if in, if in that many years, it's probably tomorrow <laughs> as quickly as things develop, but yeah. you know, if there is something that can be, that needs that, that is replaced with something else, but that does, that does it, you know, even, uh, even better so the, or, or easier or cheaper or, or that the result is the same, you know, keeping, keeping, like keeping the result the same, then that's, then, uh, you know, we said, why should we have something against this? Why would we need the exactly the same cable, you know, when there's in 20 years, there's a cable that, I don't know, maybe you don't even need cables anymore or something, you know, why, why would that be a, um, uh, what would that be a thing? So that's kind of the, but that's coming from a very practical, uh, slightly going into into like, what is it actually about? Because it's also a philosophical uh, question, right? And I'm imagining conservators in the future um, watching this interview to try to figure out what they should do. <laughs> yeah. um, I, but it, you could, I guess, against that argue that your work is so sensitive in its registration of the technology of its moment, almost like a cross section mm -hmm. through this ever flowing as you say, very rapidly transforming yeah. technological apparatus, and that it's as evocative of the particular moment in which it was conceived as early photography is of that new technology or early film. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I could also imagine you taking a very, very archeological relationship to works that are even only three or five years old and saying, well, you know, it has to be preserved and exactly that condition because that's what it was speaking to when we came up with it so it's interesting that you don't no take that approach. No, no because i, I think we we're, we're like tech and materials and stuff is a means to an end i think hmm. what we will we will stay do, the same basically i think we're, you we're, we're, the, but, but i think what flo and i and our group will have to do until the day we drop um is to 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 to, to you know further develop and clarify what the end is what what if this is a means to you know what what is the what is worth preserving that and and i'm sure we we'll, like i in my wish would be that some of them you know stay stay relevant but that's so um and not for tech reasons i think for contextual reasons we, i think we're trying to speak to and uh, trying to, to speak and broaden also our vocabulary to, to simplify it. So it becomes, you know, not very specialist. And that applies also to the way the work is shown. It, it shouldn't require, it shouldn't require, um, you know, specialist this or that uh, uh, everywhere to maintain. I, I will not forget uh, Maxine Frankel, who, who was massively supporting the, the rain room process in um, by, by commissioning the first one back in, in 2010 and we visited their collection and they had a, um, a, a very sort of 1930s, 40s work, motorized, beautiful kinetic work by a Russian artist whose name escapes me. And she she was ruthless. She just was like, no, switch it on. And Flo and me were looking at it and Stu back in the day and we were like, ah, but the, 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 you know, the, the motor, the rubber belt is almost popping and stuff and she was ruthless she was like no but it's a you know it's a sculpture and the artist 
insisted it has to be used and when it pops then we'll, we'll have it refurbished and i really like that approach they sort of are You seem to have lost Hannes there, right at the right at the end. But oh, and Flo, you're actually muted. <laughs> I said, always very thoughtful. Sometimes he has that. <laughs> <laughs> well, in a, in a way, it's a good uh, moment to leave it on because we're really talking there about the um, fact that this technology and the work you're making is a living thing that sort of goes off into its own. Uh, trajectory after it leaves your hands and you can re-intervene with it, but it also will have a will of its own, as Zoom seems to do. <laughs> yeah. So it's a fascinating conversation to end it on. Um, listen, thanks to both of you. I hope Hannes can still hear me. Thank him. Um, and uh, it has been a, a fantastic conversation. Uh, we will, of course, be back next week. Hold on to your hats. We actually have Philippe Stark on the program next week, um, if all goes well. It's going to be a pre-recorded interview. Uh, but please tune in at our normal time. We'll broadcast at 11 o'clock Eastern time next Wednesday. And um, I will just close by uh, wishing you all a happy four years of a very sedate Biden administration. <laughs> so, thanks, Flo um, and uh, Hannes very much for joining Design Dialogue. It's been great to have you.